What's going on? Alex here, and today I'm answering your questions from the YouTube comments. And today's question has to do with the gift and income tax implications of gifting a house. Let's take a look. Now, this question was posted as a comment to the video I made about gift taxes, which if I do say so myself was excellent, so feel free to check it out. But it goes as follows. I have a question. I bought a rental property back in 1996 for $420,000 and now it's worth $2 million. If I sell now, I would have to pay the capital gains tax. What if I gift that house to two of my children and file a 709 form? Am I still subject to capital gains tax? Are my children subject to capital gains tax? If my children sell the house, are they subject to capital gains tax? All right. These are great questions. So with regard to the implications of selling the rental property, let's talk about that for a second. If you were to sell the rental property when it's in your hands, then generally you would be subject to capital gains taxes on the difference between the adjusted basis, which is the price for which you purchased the property minus depreciation, plus any improvements that you made to the property while you held it. And those calculations will generally get you to your adjusted basis. The adjusted basis is then compared to the selling price of the home. There are some adjustments for selling costs and things of that nature. But in general, yes, you would be subject to capital gains taxes. Now, assuming this property is not held as inventory, you're not a flipper of properties, and you're not in that business, then that would be the default treatment in many cases. So you're looking for ways to possibly optimize this and you think to yourself, well, what if I gift that house to two of my children and file form 709? Am I still subject to capital gains tax? So if you were to give this property to the children, you would be required to file form 709 because if you gift more than $15,000 to a particular individual in a particular tax year, whether it's cash or property, then essentially you trigger the requirement to file form 709. That has its own implications because the threshold for the filing is 15,000. So you get a 15,000 freebie per individual per tax year. On top of that, the difference between the 15,000 and the fair market value that you gifted to each individual, fair market value of the property, that is known as a taxable gift. And what that's going to do is decrease your lifetime estate tax exclusion amount. Now, currently in tax year 2020, the estate tax exclusion amount is $11.58 million, okay? So that is the amount that an individual can exclude from the estate tax. But the estate tax and the gift tax are linked because what Congress does not want people doing is individuals with a significant amount of assets in their estate, they can get the idea that, oh, I'm just going to gift it out to all these different individuals while I'm on my deathbed and I, I don't have to pay estate taxes. That's why gift taxes throughout one's lifetime and the estate tax are linked to make sure that assets just don't fly out of your estate at an opportune time and forego the estate tax altogether. So if you gift more than that $15,000 to any individual in a particular tax year of property or money or both, then you are essentially making a taxable gift in the amount above 15000 That amount reduces your lifetime exclusion amount of this $11.58 million. All right. So with that said, you have to understand that you are indeed reducing a future possible tax benefit because if your total estate is $100 million, you're going to expose more of that to the estate tax down the line. But the important thing to keep in mind is you don't actually pay any gift taxes until you completely exhaust that amount, which is currently $11.58 million in taxable gifts. So you do have some cushion here before you're actually paying gift taxes, but keep in mind that any amount that you give to any particular individual over that $15,000 threshold in fair market value, that is going to decrease your lifetime estate tax exclusion amount. So there are some dynamics at play here, but no immediate gift tax that you'd be subject to. Will you be subject to capital gains tax? No. So if you make that gift of those assets, essentially whatever your basis happens to be, let's say it's $500,000, that gets transferred to the new owners. It's a transferred basis. 
So essentially, if there's two new owners, each one would get two hundred fifty thousand dollars in general of that basis being five hundred thousand to begin with. And once the property is sold, then the capital gains tax would generally be applicable. So in this case, you're asking if the children are going to be subject to capital gains tax, not at the time of the gift. So at the time of the gift, there's really no capital gain tax implications whatsoever. Essentially, your basis, whatever happens to be, transfers to the new owners. And the only thing you would have to do is file a gift tax return and take that decrease to the lifetime exclusion from the estate tax. But you're not going to owe any gift tax unless you've exhausted your entire $11.58 million estate tax exclusion amount. All right. No capital gain implications at the date of the gift. But when the children then go to sell the house, are they subject to capital gains? In general, yes. So that's when they're going to take the hit. They're going to go to sell the property and the capital gains, which is going to be calculated much the way I described, that's when the capital gain recognition is generally going to occur unless it's you know a 1031 exchange or something like that that gets into a whole different level but in this case this is the default treatment pretty much that you're going to be looking at now it's important to remember that if your basis is the 500,000 that's transferring over to your children and they're going to end up with that huge tax hit down the road so you really didn't do anybody any favors from a tax perspective in terms of trying to minimize your tax hit and optimize your tax efficiency. So in terms of planning around these scenarios, when we're trying to reduce the amount of total taxes paid, one of the considerations is how old are you? All right. Quite frankly, and this is a morbid thought, but still applicable because it creates a huge tax benefit. If you're 98 years old, and you know that time on this earth is not going to be that much longer, then this step up in basis can be something that saves your family a tremendous amount of taxes. Now, the step up in basis basically means that let's say your basis in the property is $500,000 at the moment. It's worth $2 million. God forbid you were to pass away and this property is in your personal name. What happens is there's a step up in basis as of the date of death. So what that means is the basis is no longer, for all intents and purposes, 500000 It's now $2 million. And that is the basis in the hands of the children if they are, let's say, named in your will or beneficiaries of a trust, so forth. And if they were to sell the property immediately after you passed away, the day after you passed away, they sell the property for the $2 million, there's no income tax implication, no capital gain pretty much whatsoever. So that difference between the 500000 in basis and the $2 million, nobody ever pays taxes on. It just goes away. Step up in basis, extremely powerful stuff. So when we do planning, it's not a happy thought to think about, but I've seen situations where elderly individuals are inclined to do something nice for their children, do something nice for the grandchildren. So what they do is they gift massive amounts of property with extremely low basis while they're still alive. Then they pass away shortly thereafter and the beneficiaries completely miss out on the step up in basis. This could be millions upon millions of dollars in additional taxes that are going to be paid down the line because the basis of those assets that were gifted throughout one's lifetime is low. So that's one of the considerations to take into account. I don't know if you're 20 years old or 90 years old, but at the end of the day, if a planner does not mention the step up on basis from a financial standpoint, that's borderline negligence because it's such a huge tax benefit and definitely something that's important in planning. So in terms of structuring this, it's a bit difficult to provide any sort of guidance because really most important factor is what you're looking to achieve. What's the goal at the end of the day? There may be different ways to structure this so that it accomplishes your goals in a more tax efficient manner. But one thing that we're missing here from this fact pattern is what that goal happens to be. Now there's, there's installment sales. There's a bunch of different tools at your disposal that you may be able to use to mitigate tax liability, but it really comes down to what you're looking to achieve at the end of the day. But 
if you gift this home to two new owners, essentially it's going to play out like I described. There's going to be no capital gain implication on the date of the gift, but you will have to file a form 709 and you will take the hit to the lifetime estate tax exclusion amount. Once the children sell the property, then they're going to encounter that capital gain hit down the road. So that's something that is very important to take into account. And ultimately do consider the possible benefit of the step up in basis. It is one of the things to think about. Sometimes financial planning means that you have to consider scenarios which are, are less than fun, less than bright, but hey, it's uh, that's life and life changes very quickly, especially from a financial perspective. But hopefully function motors, this helps add some clarity to your situation, helps clarify some of this crazy stuff for you. Now, if you're watching this video and you liked it, feel free to hit that button, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel because they are going to be more videos. And if you leave a compelling question, I just might make a video especially for you answering it and clearing up any confusion because that's what I do and I'm here to please. With that said, hopefully this was helpful. Thanks for watching. Okay, and we just got a question here from Andrea. Thank you for your question. I'm going to answer it right now. I'm not going anywhere. So is this because the basis changes once the family member passes? Yes. So the step up in basis is triggered by an individual who has the assets in their own name passing away. All right. So death is what provides this tax benefit. I know it's morbid. Okay. Believe me, but that's how the tax code is written. So you need to essentially die to get this tax benefit. And the same would apply if they own those assets in a revocable living trust. So if they started a trust before they passed away and they put those assets into that trust, once they pass away, the step up in basis is still applicable. All right. So it doesn't create any sort of issues in that respect. Now, if you have that property in some sort of business entity, if it's in an S corp, if it's in a partnership, then you're going to have problems with regard to the step up. It's not going to work as smooth and majority of situations. But when the property is in a person's individual name, then in that case, you are most likely going to benefit from the step up in basis. But one more thing to keep in mind, it's not only a step up in basis. It can be a step down in basis, depending on the fair market value compared to the adjusted basis at the date of death. So this can all work in reverse and it can actually create a detrimental situation in that you had basis up here, the person passes away, the fair market value is lower, and now their basis is, is lower So because it was a step down in basis. So now when you go to sell it, you have a bigger gain. It can work both ways, and it's important to understand those dynamics. And there, there's other things to keep in mind, like the alternative valuation date, uh, things like that. So in these situations, getting a planner involved is crucial to make sure you can navigate all this crazy stuff. So Andrea, hopefully this answers your question. Thanks so much for watching, and thanks for your comment. All right, so we've got a comment from Lewis, and it is that Biden wants to get rid of the step up in basis. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I try not to get into politics on this channel. I try to keep it to the tax side of things as much as possible. But I guess the question is, in terms of getting rid of the step up in basis, what is the goal there? I would imagine that it's to affect wealthy people and subject a lot more of their assets to the estate tax and to have them pay more in, in capital gains. The issue there is that wealthy people can generally afford very clever tax advisors. And often when ideas like this come about, even before, let's say, Biden gets elected, even before the law is enacted, these people are cooking up ways to not avoid, but to plan around any new tax laws that may come around the bend so that as soon as it's signed, as soon as the ink hits the paper, they can call their clients to say, hey, don't worry about this new bill that just passed. We got you covered. Here's a new structure to protect your assets, to mitigate estate tax and income tax liability, reduce capital gains and so forth. So as, as smart as the people in Congress want to make the case that they are, there's also very smart people on the private side 
whose job it is to make sure their clients pay as little in taxes as possible. So while it's it's an idea to get rid of a, the step up in basis, I can tell you that rich people benefit from it just as much as not so rich people. And this could be a property that somebody bought for $30,000 and it appreciated to $200,000 while they owned it, then they passed away. So the person that inherits that property isn't necessarily a billionaire or a millionaire, what have you, but they're still getting a huge benefit because then it could sell that property on the very next day and essentially have no income tax implications for the most part. So this is not something that only rich people can use. It's not something that only the wealthy could take advantage of. It's something that's generally applicable and a lot of taxpayers benefit from it. So I would question the drive behind that sort of legislation. But hey, you know, sometimes a lot of things are said in an election year that never make their way into reality. So it might be one of those things. Who knows? As far as I'm aware, the step up basis has been around for quite a while and plenty of administrations have not done a thing about it. So we'll see how it plays out. Who knows? One of the funniest words in the tax world. And yes, us tax people, we laugh. We have senses of humor, okay? Uh, one of the most funny words is the word permanent because sometimes you're looking at provisions that they put out in the tax code and they say, this is a permanent provision. And then the very next year, another provision comes out that completely eliminates the permanent nature of that initial provision. So everything changes. It's all fluid and you have to plan accordingly. Uh, but I would question whether that's actually going to pass. We'll see because really there, there's a lot of people who benefit from it. And to take that away, I don't think would be all that beneficial. So, Lewis, thank you for your questions. I appreciate it. If you feel like this video was helpful, again, smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, and any other questions, leave them in the comments below. And who knows? I just might make a video especially for you. With that said, hopefully this was helpful. Thanks for watching.